This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. John Thieland is the award-winning founder and CEO of Argus Insights, a new type of market intelligence company seeking to connect the dots between technology innovation and consumer adoption. John holds a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering from Stanford University and is an expert in consumer response to technology. Hello, John. Welcome. Hello, Larry. Thank you so much. So let's start at the beginning. What is Argus Insights? So Argus Insights is a company that takes data from that consumer spread crumbs from around the world and uses that to figure out who's winning the hearts and minds, who's losing, and why. And we gather our data from social media, from consumer reviews in multiple languages and multiple markets to understand what's driving adoption and, and what's driving disappointment. Well, your background's mechanical engineering. Why did you decide to start the company? It's always good to experience a need before you create a solution. And in my past experience, I've been working on the design of products that people use every day, on everything from laptops to smartphones to medical devices to spy satellites. And I was in a unique position in 2007, 2008, where I was at Synaptics, a company that makes touchscreens. And a small device had come out from Apple called the iPhone. And the only place you could buy the computing technology to the iPhone was Synaptics. And so my job on the technical marketing point of view was to help customers understand how to integrate multi-touch technology into their smartphones and use that to compete against Apple. You would think after the iPhone was launched, that would be the easiest job on the planet. It wasn't. I had Nokia on more than one occasion say, well, actually, we don't need you. The iPhone's not a threat. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how are you measuring that? Well, we have a Gartner research that says it's just a, it's not smart enough to be called a smartphone, and Forrester says it won't have any impact on the marketplace, and our own customers love our products, and look at the technology in it. I mean, it's just a 2G radio. It takes really bad pictures. We are not worried about Apple at all. And what I realized at the time was that Nokia was measuring the wrong market signal. They were measuring all the traditional ligand indicators, and they didn't understand what Apple had done to generate smiles from a pile of what people perceived to be inferior technology. And I knew there had to be a better way to do that market research effort. And so I actually took the research I'd done during my PhD at Stanford and put it off the shelf, made sure the master works, and started a company around that to try to help companies leverage the data they already had that people were already using to drive better insights, to drive better action, to kind of keep things like what happened to Nokia, because complete failure in the marketplace from happening to other companies. But there's lots of companies that seek to analyze consumer behavior. What is it that makes your approach unique? So I, I spent oh, some formative years of my career at the design firm IDEO, in which a lot of what we learned was how do you observe what people don't answer when you ask them questions, so the questions that you don't, the, what they say to the questions that you don't answer. Because we found that surveys and focus groups were great. We're getting the answers you're already looking for. But to understand the latent needs and where the opportunities for, for innovation were, you had to kind of watch and listen. And the technology we developed at Argus allows us to listen to conversations at scale. And what distinguishes us from other people who do kind of social media analytics is that we've been able to time and time again tie our metrics to the outcomes. We've actually beat Wall Street estimates of iPhone sales almost every quarter for the past four years just by using the public data we pull in and our, and into our tools and, and technology. Well, is your goal to track consumer behavior or to predict consumer behavior? Both, because it turns out people's use cases and their behaviors don't change as fast as the products do. And as we see new capabilities come out or new uh, use cases come out, we can see the consumers react to that. Like when Apple integrated Siri into the iPhone, even though you could buy Siri as an app before that, that integration changed people's perceptions of voice activation as technology and this whole personal assistant move that was coming through. And so we're able to kind of see the co-evolution of technology and consumer behavior at the same time. And when most people are trying to figure out how to put more megapixels and gigahertz into people's hands, we're able to understand, well, what are people doing with that? What's actually the driving scenario? What are they falling short on, right? Is it because they want more bandwidth? Is that extra four megapixels really going to move the needle from a market share standpoint? 
And so connecting the, bridging that gap between the classic technology challenge of, oh, four is better, and, well, actually, I have enough, and helping our clients figure out what about their customers is not being served today that creates opportunities to disrupt their competition, all by listening to what people are saying. Well, it's interesting thinking about that, because one of the things that Apple has done over the last several years, especially since the release of the iPhone, is they've stopped marketing technology as technology. They're not talking megapixels. They're not talking gigahertz. They're talking uh, benefits that the the end user gets, as opposed to to marketing the chips themselves. It sounds to me that 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 is, is talking directly to the consumers. Is that a true statement? That is true. Though I, I would actually argue that part of the reason Apple kind of slowed down in the past few years is they've kind of fallen off that wagon. If you look at their past uh, several keynote uh, launches of new products, they show more technology than they necessarily do. Um, actually, the cool use features, and, and and I say that by, you know, they show a three D exploded views of the camera lenses, or they actually show you the millions of transistors on the A six chip, you know, showing what would make the technology to the silicon folks just drool with the number of density of transistors they have on that is very different than what most consumers are used to seeing, and so they're sure they've lost their way a little bit in the past couple of launches, and I think that's part of them what's what's been their challenge in the soft adoption of the Apple Watch and things of that sort. Um, watching videos of people forging gold to make a watch is interesting to people who know and love manufacturing, but for people who are trying to you know spend money on a device that helps and adds value to their life, they don't know why that manufacturing process impacts them because we didn't get the punchline on that. I had a, a tremendous amount of fun going over your website and and the your web your web address is on the screen during our conversation. And I discovered a phrase that I tripped over that I want to have you explain to me. Your website describes the company as a, quote, big data-driven market coach. What does that mean in English? <laughs> uh, you, you, you caught me. We are playing with some positioning piece there. Um, what, I, what we've been able to kind of show is that we're able to actually measure quite accurately the market that the companies have and then coach them to shift what they do and how they talk about what they do to set more of what the market's looking at. And so, and we do that because we use big data as a way to do that. It's less about a bunch of creatives sitting in a room with a whiteboard and thinking about what would it be cool if. It's more about, yeah, we just got through calling through all the information from 600,000 smartphone users, and this is what they're looking at. This is what's exciting to them. And this is what it means for you because this is where you are fitting what they need and this is where you're disrupting what they need. Well, well, take a step back, and for people that don't know, define what big data is and exactly how intrusive is it in an individual consumer's life? So that's a really good question. Uh, big data, the way most people talk about it, are, are how do we have terabytes and petabytes of consumer information about not even just consumer information, about machine information, all the server logs for all your Facebook pictures or your Fitbit data from all those steps that you took. And how do you bring all that data information together to have one plus one equals seven? And where we differ, where we kind of play in that space is that we bring in the breadcrumbs that people leave in consumer reviews, Twitter, Facebook, blog posts, discussion board, things of that sort. And then use that to weave in a, an, an anonymous way who these people are in groups and target segments and what needs are being met or not and what brand affinities they have and things of that sort. We're able to actually develop very robust psychographic segmentation based on our big data analytics. And it's not intrusive because all of our stuff is based on passive listening. There's no surveys. There's no video cameras. Or, we do none of that stuff. There are companies doing that who are using, for example, um, in-store security camera footage as a way to understand where to put sale information or advertising information. There's a lot of very active collections where they're asking people, for example, in the wearable space, here, wear this, and we're going to use your data to go figure out what to do for um, Blue Cross and Blue Shields healthcare plants. Not necessarily with the consumer knowing what's going on with it. So we try to stay on the good side of big data as it relates to consumer behaviors. One of the, the charts that I saw on your website was the prediction that the Amazon Fire would fail about three days after it first shipped, just based upon customer satisfaction with the device. Are you really trying to help predict the future? Is that what your clients are looking at? Are they looking at a much more understandable interpretation of what's going on in the market right now? How do we best interpret both. the charts that we saw on your website? It's, it's a combination of both. Because if you think about traditional market research reports that people buy, they get a forecast for the next five years. 
uh, and they tend to get that forecast updated on a quarterly basis, in which they get a guess as to what last quarter was about 60, 90 days later. And so currently companies are trying to steer their strategic growth and their tactical decision-making based on forecast information that they know to be at least already three to five months old. It's sort of like trying to drive to the future using your your rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. And what we're able to do is to take that timeline down to days rather than months. And what we've been able to do in, in many cases, so in the case of the Fire Phone, we saw consumers basically thumbs down it pretty rapidly. It's one of the most dramatic falls from grace we've ever seen in a product launch within three days after launch. And they didn't let on to the rest of the marketplace knowing that that was such a bad failure until a month later. We've seen that with Samsung. We've seen that with Apple. We've seen that with a number of cases, both good and bad, where, oh, my goodness, it was fantastic. Did you see what just happened? And, you know, they said they sold $25 million, but that was just channel stuffing. And that allows us to kind of yeah, some of them will validate that the methods and tools and metrics that we use actually do reflect what the market's doing. And the trends tend to be actually somewhat predictive. Um, I first showed it in the PhD research a, a thousand years ago, but even more recently with a client, we were able to take their retail price data and our demand metrics and predict their sales volume eight weeks into the future. Mm. And the reason is, is that there's patterns to success and failure. And we're able to look at those patterns across the Oh my goodness! We have over a data on over seven thousand products, and look at the dynamics to kind of figure out what's the thumbprint of, of 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 a winner, a loser, and a slow burner. And there's a whole class of products that we kind of call "Why did you bother launching this?" Um, but very quickly, kind of understanding across consumer electronics, um, appliances, package consumer packaged goods, smartphone apps, every category we've had a chance to kind of test the the, the methodologies and the theory. It's shown that we can actually not only kind of speed up that time to kind of, oh, this is what just happened, uh, but also then take that same data and attempt to extrapolate to the future. With this kind of research, it sounds like your typical client has is, is got to be a really huge company. Who are typical clients? And the so- other side of this is, can we as, as consumers benefit from the research that you're, you're doing? So, uh, yeah, we, I like to say we're a small company with big clients. Um, we've, we've helped Fortune 500 retailers figure out what products go on the shelf. Uh, global manufacturers figure out what their roadmap needs to be to figure, uh, based on what consumers need tomorrow as well as today and their own weaknesses and their, what, where their competitors are weak. We've also worked – we basically worked throughout the entire consumer electronics or consumer goods supply chain, people who make components, uh, people in the logistics chain, people who figure out where the parts need to go based on what – the demand is, you know, what's are they buying more iPhones in, 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 in uh, Europe than they are in China, and how do you react to that? But we've also had small companies, too, because it turns out once you've in- instrumented a market, the economies of scale allow us to address not only the needs of big companies but small firms, too, because there's no reason a startup should have to pay uh, a major market research company $120,000 for data that's six months old especially when it's so readily available today with the tools and methods that we have today. In terms of addressing consumers, we've toyed with that a lot because the most common question I get asked by friends and family is, what smartphone should I buy? Oh, let me go look at the data. Uh, and they always come back, oh, I love it. So you picked the right one. I'm like, cool. <laughs> um, and, and the answer is not always buy Apple either. It, it really depends on their own needs. And we've toyed with that. We actually did a pilot with, um, with Best Buy about how to use our data to inform consumer purchase uh, decisions in store, where they got some Argus data at the point of sale, at, at the at the point of uh, purchase, to say, well, what are your needs? What do you want to use this for? Well, I want more megapixels. No, 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 you don't really want more megapixels. Are you gonna, is this for selfies? Is this for family photos? Is this for hockey game films for later? Do you run? Well, I'm, I'm planning to. Well, okay. Do you actually run? Well, no. Okay, then you don't need the active sport thing because you're not going to sweat enough to actually impact your phone. And that goes on and on and on and on. Um, we just haven't found the right path to impact consumers directly. Other than we do publish a lot of our materials, as you see on our blog post, where we kind of share a snapshot of what we're seeing about brands or products or other things that we see doing well or not. Uh, most recently, we do a lot in the wearable space, um, where we kind of share who's working and who's not to... <laughs> Who has the, uh, the the longest time before the end of the summer sock tour? So, thinking of that, what trends are you seeing now in consumer technology that you find interesting? 
couple things. We're definitely seeing a saturation. We're seeing kind of this um, upgrade fatigue in smartphones. It's kind of slowing people's adoption. We're seeing yeah. the home automation and kind of IoT craze kind of stall out a little bit as people are realizing that these early devices they're all playing with ha- are incredibly needy and requires them to upgrade their networks. And now they have to figure out whether or not the alarm they got at 4 o'clock in the morning was the cat or the neighbor. And so what we're seeing across the board, especially the consumer technology market, is in such an effort to get people to buy more, they're actually manufacturing less in terms of less quality. We're not seeing the quality experiences come through because they're trying so hard to kind of shore up demand that they're just firing products out. But then I'm taking the time to go through and actually offer something that fits into people's lives with minimal disruption and actually delivers in the promise that all the advertising does. I'll give you an example from the wearables market. Uh, Basis, who was bought by Intel a couple of years ago, launched a brand new uh, smartwatch or, sorry, fitness band last fall. And only weeks ago, released a silent alarm feature. So it can kind of wake you up without going beep, 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 and just kind of use a little vibration motor to kind of shake and bake you awake. And we're over nine months since the product was launched. Yet all the research showed that one of the favorite features that people loved about their Fitbit and the jawbone ups and everything else out there was, hey, the silent alarm knows when to wake me up. So they launched a brand new product with the features they knew customers needed and wanted and couldn't live without, but they didn't do it for for nine months. And we're seeing this over and over again, where they're in their rush to get something to market, they're not taking the time to make sure that it actually fits and addresses the bare minimum functionality. Easy to set up, delivers on the promises, and they keep kind of following this kind of what I call the Swiss Army knife trap, where they keep adding features and more features and more features and more features. You end up with. Uh, Now you end up with a smartphone with 10,000 blades on it, none of which you actually use, and none of which, if you were to use them, actually perform the function very well. Um, If you've ever tried to open a bottle of wine with a corkscrew on your Swiss Army knife, you know what I'm talking about. John, I just realized that there's so much here that we could talk about. This conversation could go on for forever. But for people that want to learn more about your company and the kind of results you're doing, where can we go on the web to learn more? Definitely come to our site, uh, argusinsights.com. That website is all one word, Argus Insights, A-R-G-U-S-I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S, argusinsights.com. John Phelan is the founder and CEO of Argus Insights. John, this has been fun. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate the time.